Good evening. It's a pleasure to see you all here tonight. Um, I'm going to try a joke that John gave me. We'll see if it works. <laughs> we threatened to change the title of tonight's forum to the next revolutions and the final four, just to see who might show up. <laughs> we are glad to have you all with us tonight. This is the last sharper focus wider lens of this academic year, but not the last one altogether. Um, and we are pleased to have our panelists who I'll introduce in a moment. I also want to take a moment and introduce in the back Stephanie Cpac, who's our communications manager. And to the far right, John Beck, who actually pulls everything together on behalf of the Honors College. And so we're ever grateful to him for the work he does. For those of you who may not know, the reason that we do this forum is to highlight faculty on campus. Oftentimes we bring in people from out of state and celebrate their work and then they leave. And there's no opportunity for the community and students to continuously engage with them. And we thought we could do something a little better than that. We could highlight stars on campus and provide an opportunity for those in the community, both MSU and broader, to continue to engage with the faculty, to continue to have the conversations, and to really have broad ranging conversations that come from multidisciplinary areas. And we're not gonna solve anything tonight, but hopefully we get the dialogue going and encourage you to continue to talk about the topic. So tonight I'm going to introduce everyone and then they will go ahead in the order they were introduced and talk with you a little bit about their ideas will then provide an opportunity for them to possibly talk amongst each other, and then we'll very quickly open it up to you for questions, and John will field the questions from the floor. We have to my very far right, Brian O'Shea. He is an associate professor with a joint appointment to Lyman's Briggs College and the Department of Physics and Astronomy in the College of Natural Science. And I should pause. I don't believe I introduced myself. I'm Cynthia Jackson Elmore, the Dean of the Honors College, and we are the lead sponsor of this forum. Brian is a theoretical astrophysicist whose research focuses on galaxy formation and evolution. He uses supercomputers to perform large-scale numerical simulations of the formation of cosmological structure, starting from the first stars that form in the universe and continuing to the present day. He is particularly interested in the properties of clusters of galaxies, which have the potential to be useful probes of the fundamental properties of our universe. Brian teaches physics and astronomy courses at all levels, from introductory mechanics to graduate level astrophysics, and is one of the instructors in Lyman Briggs introductory physics course sequence, which is a two course sequence. He has also collaborated with the Advanced Visualization Laboratory at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications to make movies for PBS Nova, Discovery Channel, and National Geographic television documentaries, as well as for the Denver Planetarium, the Hayden Planetarium in New York, and the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. He earned his doctorate in physics from the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Immediately to Brian's left, we have Emily Rader. She is an assistant professor and AT&T scholar with the Department of Media and Information in the College of Communication Arts and Sciences. Her research focuses on understanding social processes that affect information sharing in user-contributed content systems. People sharing files, blog posts, photos, tags, status updates, tweets, location information without always being completely aware of who might be out there watching. And we know that that's particularly pertinent these days. Emily develops and tests theories and designs principles that foster a better understanding of what it means to be social on the web. Before earning her PhD, Emily spent five years working with an interdisciplinary team of researchers at Motorola Labs designing and evaluating next generation applications for mobile technologies. She earned her doctorate from the University of Michigan and was a 2009-2010 recipient of the highly competitive Computing Innovation Postdoctoral Fellowship Award from the Computer Research Association and the National Science Foundation. To my immediate right is Jeff Grable, 
a professor of rhetoric and professional writing and chair of the Department of Writing, Rhetoric, and American Cultures in the College of Arts and Letters. He is a senior researcher with wide research, writing in digital environments, and also a co-founder of Drawbridge Incorporated, an educational technology company. He studies how digital writing is associated with citizenship and learning. Jeff has published two books on community literacy and articles in journals such as College Composition and Communication, Technical Communication Quarterly, Computers and Composition, and English Education. Jeff earned his doctorate from Purdue University. To my immediate left is Patrick Kwan, a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering in the College of Engineering. His research and teaching interests deal with material issues in design and manufacturing, manufacturing processes, mechanical behavior of materials, and microstructured and graded materials. Specifically, Patrick works with 3D printing, figuring out how metallic components can be used in the printing process to make products stronger than the current 3D printing material. He's the recipient of the Michigan Campus Compact Faculty Staff Community Service Award, as well as the Withrow Teaching Excellence Award here at MSU. Patrick earned his doctorate from the University of California, Berkeley. And finally, to my far left is Tom Dietz, a professor of sociology and environmental science and policy in the College of Social Science. He is also assistant vice president for environmental for environmental research is, mm -hmm. okay, at Michigan State University. Tom is also co-director of the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessment Center. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has been awarded the Sustainability Science Award of the Ecological Society of America. The Distinguished Contribution Award of the American Sociological Association Section on Environment, Technology, and Society and the Outstanding Publication Award, also from the American Sociological Association Section on Environment, Technology, and Society, and the Gerald R. Young Book Award from the Society of Human Ecology. He is currently a member of the National Resource Council Committee to advise the U.S. Global Change Research Program. Thomas's current research examines the human driving forces of environmental change, environmental values, and the interplay between science and democracy in environmental issues. Thomas earned his doctorate from the University of California, Davis. And before we do the first presentation, I'd just like to ask you in advance to, um, let's celebrate the panelists that we have here today. Hi. Um, so I'd like to talk about what I think the next revolution is going to be. Um, and I'd, so the, the title of this is The Data Revolution, but really I think it should be The Data Apocalypse. And so let me explain what I mean. So first off, um, as Cynthia said, uh, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. And so as a physicist, I like to think about the world and try to take very complicated situations and break them down to their fundamental physical principles and make very sort of mathematically simple models for how the world works. And so my involvement in sort of large scale astronomy projects has really driven me to thinking about this in sort of apocalyptic terms. So, <laughs> so formally, data is a scarce resource um, when we're talking about science. Um, uh, and of course, when something's scarce, we tend to think that it's valuable. And a good example of this uh, is this fellow over here. This is uh, Johannes Kepler, who some of you might remember from, he has a satellite named after him. There are some Kepler's laws that are named after him. Um, his name comes up once in a while. He's also got a great collar. Um, but Kepler looked uh, at the motions of the planets back in the 1600s. And what he did, uh, working with um, his sort of mentor, Tycho Brahe, was spend decades mapping out the motions of the planets in the night sky. And every night that it was clear, they would map where all the planets were and painstakingly record this data. And over decades, they did this. And he stared at the patterns and thought about them and thought about them and thought about them. And 
you know, wrote Kepler's laws, which you could write on, you know, this napkin and have plenty of room to spare, and which described the motion of all of the planets in the heavens almost perfectly. Um, hence the picture of the solar system right next to it. Um, and the amount of data that he took and thought about over his career, essentially, um, could fit into a not particularly impressive email attachment. So the data was scarce and it was very valuable and it was very carefully curated. Now, today, data is easy to obtain in massive quantities. And when I say massive quantities, I mean libraries of Congress worth of data in minutes, maybe in seconds, maybe in you know, nanoseconds. And so in thinking about this, <laughs> we came up with the question, you know, can you ever have too much data? Um, is it possible to have too much sweet, sweet data? Um, and as a physicist, I prefer to frame this in a different way. And that's how do we construct theories when we can't hope to look at all of the data? So thinking back to Kepler, he had a very small amount of data about the motion of the planets. Um, and he, from that, he derived some of the fundamental laws of astronomical motion, how planets move through the, world, uh, through the, the solar system. And that pertains to basically everything in the universe. Now, nowadays, we have a much bigger problem. So this is a picture of the Atlas detector, which is at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And so this uh, is a detector that's substantially larger than the room that we're in. And it takes data at something like a petabyte a second, right? So a petabyte is, so it's giga tera peta. So it's 10 to the 15 <laughs> bytes of data per second, give or take, that comes in from the detectors. So two beams of particles, protons and antiprotons or various things, smash together and produce this huge flux of data that's over in microseconds. And how do you make sense of that? It's, it's a tremendous amount of data. And so one of the ways that this is done is by coming up with the theory first and then seeing if the data applies to the theory and doing it automatically. And that really worries me as a scientist because you can't have, when you have that sort of influx of data, you can't think about it in terms of, well, let me stare at this data, let me look at every single piece of it, let me figure out where the noise is, where, let me figure out what's missing. Instead, it's I have a huge, you know, a huge flow of data coming through, and I need to think about what my theory is first, and I can't hope to store all that data. I can't even look at it. As a scientist, I couldn't look at, you know, point oh 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 one percent of all this data as it flies by and make sense of it. Um, and so, constructing theories of how the universe works when you have this kind of data becomes very challenging because you can't grapple with it in the way that we have historically grappled with data. Um, here's a picture of another thing called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is uh, MSU is involved with and it's being built right now, and it's going to take a picture of the night sky, or many pictures of the night sky, essentially the entire observable night sky every couple of nights, and it's going to find every near-Earth asteroid, every supernova that goes off, every star that varies in brightness in the southern night sky, um, and it's going to produce many, many petabytes of data over years. And this is a, this is a similar problem where now it's not just data that's coming in all in one big burst. It's things that have come over time, vary with time, move through the sky, um, and you need to come up with ways to extract information from this huge flood of data. And there are many other systems. You know, I've put a few up here, but uh, weather, sat weather, many, many weather stations all over the place, um, the internet, people are gonna talk about that more than I will, um, you know, micro satellites, uh, television cameras, you know, video cameras everywhere, information uh, being recorded about what we eat, what we drink, our, our lives, our phones, our, you know, the energy consumption in our house. Um, and turning this enormous flood of data into some sort of model, into some sort of understanding of what's going on, maybe a physical model, maybe a social model, something like that, when there's so much data and it's so messy and each individual data point is essentially worthless. Um, I think as scientists, as people who are trying to make sense of the world, um, this revolution in data, the fact that it's, that data is now ubiquitous and essentially free, um, is actually going to cause a revolution. So not just the data itself, but really in how we think about information and how we process information and how we try to make sense of this huge stream of information around us. So, thank you.
this hooked up here. Excellent. Can you hear me? Yes? Great. So I'm Emily, and I'm here to talk to you about information also. Um, there's, there's too much of it. Hang on one second. Siri's trying to talk to me. So we're all overwhelmed by too much information. That's sort of become a fact of modern life. Um, and we rely on different kinds of technologies to help us manage all of that information. Um, these technologies uh, personalize our experiences with online information. So um, you have spam filters in your email that decide which emails you should pay attention to. And Google has personalized search that returns search results based on your past search history, on, on your location, and things like this. Um, you get product recommendations when you shop on Amazon. It, it, it uh, suggests other things for you to buy based on things that other people have bought who are similar to you. And the Facebook newsfeed also uses similar kinds of personalization technology. Um, it uses an algorithm, which is basically a, a process or a set of rules to accomplish a specific goal. And the algorithm is designed to direct your attention to certain posts and direct your attention away from other posts. So this is a quote from one of the engineers at Facebook who works on the newsfeed algorithm. And basically, it describes a ranking system that tries to determine um, which posts you will find more interesting. And it ranks those up at the top. And if a story seems less likely to be interesting to you, then it's published further down in your newsfeed so that you will probably won't see it. Um, but Facebook users tend to kind of know who their friends are. They have a list of people. It's called a friends list. They kind of know who their friends are, who, who they've agreed to have this relationship with online. Uh, but that sort of also means that if there are certain people who don't show up in their newsfeed, they kind of maybe have a sense of that too. So they might have a sense of who's missing. And a team of researchers at Facebook, actually, they did a study where they found out that having opportunities to interact with people on Facebook can strengthen your relationship with that person in the real world. So it stands to reason that if there's an algorithm that's making decisions for you about which posts are easier for you to see and consume, then that algorithm might also have an impact on who you have relationships with and who you're maintaining ties with. So there's actually a feedback loop that goes on in systems like the Facebook newsfeed. You go to, you go to Facebook, your newsfeed displays, you read some posts. Um, you might interact with some posts, you might comment on things, you might click the like button to like things. You might hide posts from people that you don't really want to hear from very much. Um, then you create some content. You create posts. Um, those posts are then stored and processed by the system. Um, it also stores the interaction history with the posts. It, it remembers who, um, who you've interacted with a lot versus who you haven't interacted with very much. And then the algorithm takes that content that's been stored by the system as input and ranks it and processes it and then displays more posts to you in your newsfeed. That's essentially the feedback loop. But this feedback loop has components that are both people and technology that are basically interacting um, to produce the experience that people have on Facebook. And about a year ago, a PhD student I was working with, Rebecca Gray and I, were wondering whether people who are using the Facebook newsfeed can actually tell whether or not there's this algorithm that's going on in the background. Um, so we basically wanted to know if users could notice symptoms of personalization happening in the background um, as they used Facebook. So what we did was we asked them about it. We asked them whether um, they believe that the Facebook newsfeed shows them everything that all of their friends post. Or, uh, and then to explain to us why they think so. And we analyzed their responses. And one thing we found is that users definitely do notice when posts are missing from their newsfeed. It might happen because one of their friends says, hey, did you see that photo I posted the other day? And they didn't actually see it. Um, it might happen because they go visit their friend's timeline, and they can see their posting history, and they see things there they don't remember seeing. Uh, but. It's not really clear whether this is because of the algorithm or because maybe um, they just skimmed and, and missed that post that day, or maybe they don't remember seeing it, or maybe they just didn't visit Facebook at all that day and they didn't see it. Um, so then we thought, well, you know, 
maybe there are just certain people that people don't really care if they hear from, so it's okay if they miss those posts. And the people we talked to actually felt that way too, but they also were noticing patterns in their news feeds. So that, you know, we had people that told us, oh, I only ever see posts from people I'm not very close with. And then we had other people tell us, oh, I only ever see posts from people that I'm really close with and I already know everything that's going on in their lives, so I don't need to see those posts. And the things that these experiences had in common were that people were actually being able to identify regularities and patterns in what they were seeing that violated their expectations for what they felt like they should be seeing. And then we had uh, sort of a third group of people who took this even a step further. And those people noticed the patterns and then started essentially trying to speculate about what kind of mechanism might be causing them to see these patterns. And so they said to us things like, um, well, if I like a lot of that person's posts, then I'm gonna see more of that person's posts in my newsfeed. Or I only ever see posts from people that I'm really close to, so if I go visit that person's profile page a lot, then Facebook will think that I'm really close to that person and I'll get to see more of their posts. And so people were actually starting to kind of change how they interacted with Facebook to try to get it to show them the things that they wanted to see. And so we call that speculating about the algorithm. And what these findings showed us is essentially even if the users aren't made explicitly aware by the system that there's an algorithm at work, they are able to kind of reverse engineer how it's working just based on repeated experiences with the algorithm. And the reason why this is interesting is because as people are changing their behavior in response to the algorithm, they're also changing how the whole system works. So if I notice that certain kinds of posts get a lot of attention from other people, and I want attention too, then I might change the kinds of things that I post about or the kinds of words that I use in my posts to try to get more attention. And this means that the inputs to the system are changing, which changes the outputs. So you end up with this feedback loop that can create unintended consequences. So personalization and content filtering are everywhere. Facebook is not the only place that this happens. And I was trying to come up with a, sort of a next revolution, fu futuristic example that I, that I could, could talk about today um, to close my talk. And the Apple Watch has been on my mind a lot because it's, it's a really expensive thing and I'm, I'm just wondering what the heck are people gonna use this thing for? Um, and you know, we use personalization technology to help us um, uh, choose things to consume, to choose things to read. And I sort of feel like the next revolution is gonna be algorithms to help us manage our attention and manage our time. And so I found this mock-up on the web. Um, there's an app, it's called Short. You can, you can download it. It helps uh, you decide if you have a little bit of downtime, uh, suggest things for you to read based on how long it thinks it's gonna take you to read them. And so this is a, a notification, potential notification for uh, a, an Apple Watch that says, oh, you're 10 minutes early to your next meeting. You want to read something? Based on potentially information that's in your calendar and uh, detection of where you're at, um, it could uh, help sort of direct your time to certain things. This seems kind of innocuous, right? But what if it's um, suggesting that you could get a great deal on something in your wish list, but you have to buy it in the next 10 minutes? based on the idea that you're more susceptible uh, to purchasing things uh, under time pressure or something like that. So as we delegate more and more of our choices to technology, um, it becomes much more important and interesting to think about how feedback loops like this uh, are maybe gonna affect how we manage our time and attention. Thank you. Education, scintillating, isn't it? So in many ways, education hasn't changed much in a really, really, really long time. This is one of my favorite pictures because while it's clearly dated, it's clearly not dated. We still sit in desks often. We still sit in rows often. We still have teachers in front of classrooms often doing things like I'm doing right now. 
talking at you. We still think in terms of terms, nine weeks, 15 weeks. We still largely organize education in terms of classes. We still largely value time spent in seats. That time spent in seats plus performance on things like exams and quizzes, which we've had since antiquity, are still how we mostly manage education um, for young and old. And so this has become a perplexing problem for me for, for my career, which, which for reasons I'll try and unpack and explain a little bit. So this, seemingly la this seeming lack of change in education plus the stunning, I think truly stunning developments in computing and um, maybe even more interestingly in networking have led many to identify the present moment as a moment of revolutionary change in education. Now, anyone who's a, a historian of educational technology will also quickly point to the television and the discourse around television when it first came out as a truly transformative um, learning technology. Everybody thought that the correspondence course plus television was going to do everything that we think computers and, and, and networks are going to do today. What comes around goes around. And so the current um, sort of hot book right now is Kevin Carey's The End of College. But the kinds of things that Kevin Carey says in his book are the kinds of things that hundreds of people are saying right now. Education is the next industry to be transformed, and information technology is often the revolutionary driver for that change. And the outcomes that these revolutionaries promise are things like reductions in cost of education, including free education, greater access to education, and better quality education. These are all good things. I'd sign up for that revolution. I think most of us in the room would sign up for that revolution. But to date, we really haven't seen it. Um, this is my um, clever rendition of a MOOC, a massive open course. Um, even the MOOC moment, which we are sort of maybe at the edge of, maybe at the end of, um, maybe in the middle of. I find I, I found the MOOC moment for reasons that maybe we can unpack in the question and answer. I found it a, a very compelling moment to be in, to be honest with you. Um, but even the instant disruption that MOOCs have promised have failed to produce. In the short term, I think the current revolutionary formulas for education are going to continue to fail to produce the revolution that they hope for. And that's because most educational revolutionaries and educational technology revolutionaries don't understand education as a system, and they don't understand learning as a process and a phenomena. And so most MOOCs, to use that example, um, fail, uh, continue to reproduce our most ineffective pedagogy, and that is doing exactly what I'm doing to you right now, lecturing at you about something. So, and that's because with information technology is understood as the revolutionary driver in education, Information technology is going to understand the problem of education as one of information delivery, one of moving content from point A to point B, and that's simply not going to produce the kinds of revolutions that I think most people want. Which brings me to this little triangle, which is a particularly useful triangle for education, but also translates to other kinds of industries and sectors, and that is the relationship between access, scale, and quality. So most thinkers about education and education to technology um, will focus on um, our ability to achieve one or two of the issues in this triangle. But it's very difficult to get all three. So we can increase access to education, and in some cases increase um, the scale at which we, we grow educational access. But sometimes we often have to sacrifice quality um, for that. We can have really compelling, high quality, high value educational environments, learning environments, but sometimes those are hard to scale, and they can be very expensive, which limits access. So most, most thinkers about education right now um, focus on our inability and our desire to get to all three. And that's what I'm going to point to as the coming revolution, is our ability to actually achieve um, measurable gains around access, scale, and quality. So what's that going to look like? I do believe that revolutions in education are coming, or I wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. This is sort of what I do for a living. Um, but revolutionaries, uh, revolutions in education are going to be driven by elegant learning technologies, not information technologies. And I think there's a couple of things that are going to get us there. One is I do believe in the power of technology in some specific ways. I do think algorithms are getting smarter, um, both with regard to learning analytics, the ability to turn some learning analytics around to teachers and, and students in a formative way so that we can take action and make interventions in a timely way. 
Um, and I am interested in the ways in which algorithms, the kinds of personalization algorithms um, that we heard a little bit about, can actually be pivoted towards um, making sort of useful learning technologies for people. But I think we have to be a whole lot smarter about how we build good learning theory and good cultural theory into the learning experiences that we create, both the sort of human, inter human interfacing learning experiences and the technolo technologically mediated interfaces. The best learning technologies that I'm aware of are actually really elegant theory made into software or theory made into, so into experiences. So I think the revolution is going to come once we start connecting humans in rich ways provide them with complex work to do, and enable them to have rich experiences both online and offline, and endeavor and risk um, our willingness to do that at scale and in ways which increase access to education around the world. Thanks. It's the engineers who can't get the computers right. to work. I'm just, I'm just saying that for the I'm saying that for the record. I, I need to uh, log in. <laughs> okay. It wouldn't be a sharper focus wider lens if we didn't have technology glitches right. every time. And and while we're waiting, I also want to say thank you to those of you who follow us regularly and come out on a regular basis. We do notice, we do appreciate you coming, and we do appreciate you telling others about the forum. So I can tell you, engineers are the only ones who cannot really work their computers. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, uh, I, what I wanted to talk to you about today is a 3D printing technique that you've been hearing about uh, probably the last couple of years. So I think uh, 3D printing has been around for many years. Uh, in fact, when I just got here 20 years ago, we are purchasing 3D printing. Um, so that was at that time where people are start to looking at it, and it fizzled out for a while. And uh, it came back again, and mainly because I think it's the economist who, who made, us, made this happen. Because uh, their cover page, as you can see there, is uh, Print Me a Stradivarius. Uh, I don't know anybody know about the music, but Strad is the uh, exquisite uh, Italian violin that was made, made in maybe 1700s and cost about, I think, the most expensive one is like 14 million. <laughs> so if you can actually print 14 million dollar violin with a 3D printing every day, you will be very rich. So, what I wanted to tell you is that uh, it's not really a Strat, but it's a, it's a replica of a violin. So if you look at individual component, there are actual body, which is made of 3D printing technique, but there are metal pieces, strings and other things are there, which are not 3D printed. In fact, it's very hard to make these things in 3D printing technique. So, there are, and for example, like a wrench. Uh, one at the top that you see is the wrench made out of plastic material. But if you use that wrench, I'm sure you won't be able to unbolt anything. So you have to go with a metal piece. When you go from this uh, plastic one to metal, there's a huge difference in how we make it. In fact, I don't think we can still make that metal wrench with a 3D printing as of yet. So what people are thinking based on these, um, these cover pages that, oh, you can basically print something uh, just like how you print your uh, printouts and then be able to make things and then get it to work. Uh, it's not quite there yet. So I wanted to basically show you a little bit historic perspective how things were made back then. So I'm going back to really old times. 4000 BC, where people are making out of powder. And powder is a very important thing because that's the major technique that we use in order to do 3D printing at this moment. So 2500 BC, uh, they are casting it, forging it, heat treating even back then. And the Romans has these uh, production where they can actually make these glassware, metal, textiles, you know, mass production way. 
And these things have changed substantially uh, in England, uh, 1760 to 1830, which we call first industrial revolution, where John Wilkinson developed what they call machine tool. Um, I, I, you may not know the sig significance of these, uh, why the machine tool is important, but you can actually repeat these things. So you can make one part and you can make exactly the same thing with a machine tool. So what James Watts did, uh, he made a steam engine using that machine tool technology and eventually at L.A. Whitney start making these parts interchangeable. So if something goes out of order, you can make it into another part and you can use that product again. So there are a series of a revolution. Henry Ford is one of those guys uh, out of Michigan, so I kind of highlight him here. But uh, there is a second industrial revolution back in 1950s and 70s where we use computers and microchips, uh, which are uh, unable to connect to people uh, far away from here and then be able to drive a machine that's 2,000 miles away from here. So in addition, there is a, another revolution that came in, 1980, development of the internet. So we are kind of thinking about, is that really third industrial revolution? So if you can make a CAD file, CAD is a computer-aided design file, which means if I'm making this cup, for example, I can make this in a computer, actually feed all the information into a computer, which will dissect these things and make it into a part. So if you can do that, you can make it into a 3D printed part. So there are some things that has been done, and though we call it mass customization. That what that means is that we can customize these products. Uh, if you look at the car that has been customized, not customized, but it's a mass produced. But mass customization means it can be a very uh, individual oriented, for example, orthodontic uh, uh, service. So you have to basically go to the dentist and map out your teeth. And then once they know what needs to be corrected, they can make a little uh, device where you can put it on to your teeth and then eventually they'll change the shape of your teeth. They eventually have a, you have a very uh, nice and clean and uh, uh, tooth arrangement. And these things can happen in the hearing aids, so those things are already happening. But there is the other things that you can do because we can do this. Uh, this is the one product that, I, I, oh, I can do this. This is the one product, and this is made of one, two, three, possibly four parts. But if you can do 3D printing, you can make it into a one part because extra additional uh, complexity in the design is there's no cost associated with it. You can actually print anything you want. Um, so geometry is not a problem. But in traditional manufacturing, um, you have to think about how you're gonna make it and there's only limit. There's a very limitation what kind of shape you can make. So 3D printing changes all that, but there are, we are still far from it. And so I'm gonna, I don't know how much time I have, but there are basically a three main uh, way of making this. One is uh, stereolithography, which is uh, what they call liquid polymer that is photosensitive. So we call it photosensitive liquid polymer, where what that means is a liquid becomes a solid when you introduce a light to it. So you can actually move these light to solidify these liquid phases, and then if you can repeat it layer by layer, you can eventually make this into a 3D printing uh, method. The other one is very common now. In fact, we have probably about 20 of them in the College of Engineering. It's a, what they call fused deposition. So you can, I think the best way to think about it is a toothpaste. Uh, so a small thread of toothpaste comes in and put it down a layer and then move up one layer, put it down, and you keep repeating this process. Eventually, you will make very complicated shape. The other process that I'm currently working on is not quite <laughs> laser sintering, but it's a powder. So there is a powder bed which layers of one layer, and then you put a binder phases where you want, and then that gets lower, and another layer comes in, and put another binder phases, and you repeat that all that process, you can eventually make 3D printing uh, part. 
So this is the uh, Spartan helmet that we made in, the, in our uh, lab. So this is the 3D printing machine that I have. And this is the Spartan helmet that we created inside the computer. And we can actually feed these uh, code into this machine. And uh, we're able to make this 3D printing uh, Spartan helmet. Okay. So I'm not going to go into all these details, but the major uh, the disadvantage of using 3D printing is we can make it as large as we want, depending how big the uh, shape is. And we can make it as complicated as we can. But the problem is integrity. That means material cannot sustain the load. So if you think about making this, the chair you are sitting in, the leg has to be about four or five times bigger at this point. So it's not really a feasible solution for the structure application, but there are a lot of applications where this is still feasible. And because of these, uh, these things, now anybody can make anything. Uh, so it will be interesting to see how the business side will evolve because of these techniques. So I'm going to just <coughs> conclude my talk. Uh, at this point. We have a, yeah, have a, a PowerPoint over on the uh, stick. I think it, oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah if you just okay. click it up to uh, full yeah. screen. Yeah, let me slide it over so I can see what it is I'm saying. So, <laughs> so when John told me about this, I thought I ought to consult some major theorist of revolution, Lenin, and then I realized I didn't know whether I should look at Vladimir Ilyich Lenin or John Lenin. <laughs> so I sort of skipped that stage. Um, and what I want to talk about really isn't so much a revolution, but uh, the idea that comes out of both of those Lenins that revolutions perhaps by definition seem to be out of control. And I wanted to raise the issue of what well, can we govern revolutions? We've heard about a bunch of revolutionary technologies I'm going to talk and, and processes going on in society. I'm going to talk about a few more and, and talk about whether we can really cope with these very effectively. Um, we have the problems of the 19th to the 20th century still with us in the 21st century. Poverty, inequality, violence, discrimination, alienation, depression, mental illness, and so on. So even though we're facing a lot of new issues, the old issues persist and we have to wrestle with those. One of the things I work on a great deal is global environmental change. So just to give you a quick capsule, I teach whole courses on this. Species extinction rates right now are about a thousand times what the long-term historical background looks like. The climate that we will experience over this century is something the planet hasn't seen in about 100,000 years. The degree of acidity that, that the oceans are moving towards is something that hasn't been seen on the planet in several million years. Many chemicals to which the biosphere is exposed, and these are all over the globe now, are, are things that have never been there before, so we don't know quite what's going on. Um, I just came back from a major conference on the national parks, and given global environmental change, we have to think about Glacier National Park without glaciers. Isle Royale, uh, our closest, well, one of our closest national parks, without wolves. The Joshua Tree Monument, or National Park now, without Joshua trees. The Everglades, mostly underwater. Those are the kinds of, of changes that I take a look at. There are a bunch of other technologies, just to add two more to the list. And, and my point with these is, what are these things going to do? And I'll finally come to the point of, can we have an influence on how these things affect society? So one issue is, we're getting new forms of weapons. The ability to create novel organisms is now so cheap and easy that we have maker labs and artists are using these methods to create new forms of art by basically creating new strands of DNA. What about ISIS or the Aryan nations? Are they interested in this technology as well? Um, the US Air Force is now training more drone than conventional pilots and other forms of combat robots are in development in, uh, I think it's on the order of two dozen countries around the world. So how are we going to use that technology? Um, we have more powerful forms of science and technology than ever before, and what I want to push or submit as an argument is that every day individuals, governments, and companies make decisions that shape the future. So what the world will work, look like in five years, ten years, fifty years, and a hundred years isn't written in stone, nor is it random. It's a result of the decisions we make about technology um, and other things as well. I'm going to use two examples of decisions that were made or not made. The first is lead in gasoline. Adding tetraethyl lead to gasoline, which started in, I believe, the 1920s, 
was one of the reasons that gasoline engines came to outstrip in the market electric engines for cars, which were very prevalent in the first automobiles. Um, I won't go into the details as to why, and Patrick probably knows better than I the mechanics of that. Um, even when that was being done, even when lead was being put into gasoline to reduce knock problems in engines, the toxic effects of lead were well known. The Romans were aware of the toxic effects of lead, although they choose largely to ignore it. But the workers in these early factories were, were devastated by exposures to lead. It was no secret that lead was toxic. However, the lead industry led an active campaign that emphasized scientific uncertainties about the toxicity of lead and the cost of moving away from tetraethyl lead. Um, we know uh, and have known for a long time that lead causes impaired neural development in children, cardiovascular disease, and premature, premature death by a variety of routes. Indeed, some folks make a credible argument, I'm not sure it's correct, but it's not crazy, that homicide rates may be in some extent driven by lead exposure, that if you have a community that's deeply exposed to lead, uh, we know from high exposures amongst workers that it often leads to psychotic behavior because of its neurological effects. Um, finally, in the 1970s through 1996, we phased out leaded gas in the U.S. There's still a struggle in many parts of the U.S. to phase lead uh, out of uh, 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 ammunition because the lead ends up in, wa in water systems and it ends up being a, a serious problem um, in many ecosystems for a lot of animals in those ecosystems. So um, that's one where we took a long time to make a decision. Now here's the supersonic transport. In the 1960s, the U.S. aviation industry sought federal support to build an SST passenger plane. Uh, they had been getting support for a number of years and what they argued is that the Europeans were building one, the Soviet Union's building one. If we don't build a supersonic transport supported by government funds in the U.S., the U.S. airframe industry um, the airplane manufacturers will be devastated. Environmentalists raise concerns about the impacts of large numbers of these planes flying around the world, and in the end, the program to support SST development by the federal government was stopped in 1971. And what happened to the U.S. airframe industry? It certainly wasn't devastated by the loss of building an SST. In fact, there are no more SSTs flying. The last uh, flight was in October 2003. The technology simply never took off, and the U.S. chose not to participate. Yeah, we never had U.S. carriers doing the super fast flights to Europe that cost, I think it was 50% more than first class for every seat in the plane. Um, but on the other hand, you know, we avoided some environmental costs, perhaps. So this is a ca another case where we made a choice about technology. So all the technologies we're thinking about, what will they be like? Will they be the new tetraethyl lead, where we really do a lot of damage to ourselves for generations? Will they, they be the new SST where we decide not to go down a path of technology and it really doesn't cause any damage? Will they be the new personal computing and the ubiquitous, ubiquitous web, which I, I would argue by and large has done a lot of good for us so far and has improved human well-being by and large, uh, although who knows where we'll go in the future. So I'm arguing for some basic principles. The public, and I go here to a definition of the public by, uh, that comes from John Dewey. The public is anyone who is interested in a decision or is affected by a decision should have a voice in these decisions about what technologies <coughs> we develop. Um, we have to accept that all decisions that we make about technologies involve both facts and values. When someone says that the facts make the decision clear, I would argue that that just means that the values underlying the decision are being hidden or not being given adequate consideration. Science gives us a very good, well-proven way to get at the, at the facts. It's not without error, but the essence of science is that it self-corrects error. Science is never 100% certain, thank you, but we often know how certain we are. So science is necessary, but not sufficient for making good decisions. How can we do better? Be honest. We need to acknowledge that private decisions often have wide, unintended consequences that need to be considered, that our interests and values will differ so that we will have conflicts, and that we will never have certainty. Um, so what I would argue for is that we assess the consequences of the decisions we make. Um, and since we don't know exactly what to do and things are always changing, we have to learn as we go, be willing to change our course as we go forward, and let those affected have a say. Um, and I think I'll stop with that. 
this is a very complicated graph, and I apologize, but just very quickly, the right axis moving from left to right is more greenhouse gas emissions by U.S. states. All the little plotting symbols are abbreviations for U.S. states and the year in which the data is from. So further right you go, the more damage you're doing to the environment. Higher up on the graph you are, uh, the longer the life expectancy, the higher the human well-being. And my point is to look at the upper left. There are some states in the U.S. that are doing very well at producing human well-being even as they don't do a lot of damage to the environment. And it seems to me that this is the kind of logic we need to use in making decisions about technology. How can we enhance human well-being? What courses of action will enhance human well-being while minimizing the adverse consequences of what we do? And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. minutes to summarize across what I believe I heard. We'll see if the panelists have some questions for each other and then we'll open it up to you. Um, some of the themes that went across or points that came out, and actually Brian could have been in our last um, sharper focus wider lens about the apocalypse, um, but really are we having a data revolution or a data apocalypse? And scarcity also always creates value. Right. And so in part of this, I kept thinking, you know, I was hearing the economists and the political scientists and a lot of what Brian said, even though he was not talking about those things. And now data is widely available. What do we do with it? And, and is it possible to have too much data? And, and I shook my head, yeah. You know, it, it is possible, you know, to just have so much information that you don't know what to do with it. And, and how do we make sense of all that data? And, what does data overload really mean when we're trying to develop theories and we're trying to move forward? And a political scientist in me immediately went to when legislators are trying to pass policies, they, they don't have the time or the inclination to get all of the data to make the most informed decisions. So we're always kind of satisficing, right? We're always trying to figure out at what point are we going to stop collecting information? When are we going to stop looking at the data? And how do we know that the set of data that we use to make our decisions on was actually the right subset of data. Um, and, and again, it came through that we're, we're overwhelmed with data, and these days we use technology to help us manage everything. And it's even tracking our interactions in cyberspace. And, and the question is, is it a new form of marketing, or is it a subtle, non-threatening, maybe somewhat perverse form of stalking? You know, that we've agreed to let everyone look in on what's going on with us and give up our control. And, and how do we interact with these new technologies? Do the patterns that we begin to see go beyond social media? And how much does technology influence the choices we're making and decisions that we are giving away? We're choosing not to make decisions and letting technology do that for us and processing even our own life events. And, and what does that mean? And in all the revolutions, perhaps the place that is most deserving of a revolution has yet to really have one, which is education. And, and how do we get beyond that? How do we embrace every new technology that we think is worth something to turn the tables. You know, we talk about flipped classrooms where it's no longer, you know, the sage on the stage, the wise person having something to say. It's no longer you come into class and make meaning of what you just read, but you're making meaning outside of class. And then when you come together, you're doing something with that information. You're applying it. How do we take that and then push it out so that communities benefit immediately and the research community can move forward? And, and how do we use technology in a way that really advantages everyone and not just those that have the ability to step into the game? And also to think about the disconnect between the people creating the technology and the people that need to use the technology. And that's not just in education. And then it was interesting to hear that 3D printing, which seems like it's newfangled, has actually been 20 years in the making, right? So how many other revolutions were really just slow fizzles? And, and now we think something amazing is happening, and, and really it's just coming to its maturity. 
and thinking about when computers came on the scene and there was this leeriness about them and now everyone takes for granted that computers are a part of our everyday life even to the point that if you don't have a smartphone anymore you, you can't even really do your job right and, and what does that mean and how do people turn off there was a recent even on vacation, a large percent of Americans still stay connected and n don't have that downtime. So is technology allowing us to move forward? And, and what's the value of 3D printing? I think that we, we will get a chance to have Patrick talk to us about the, so the social implications. If anybody can make anything, you know, um, and metal then becomes usable, what about someone just printing off guns in their home for whatever purpose. What, what does that say to us? And how do we govern these revolutions? We have all these old issues that we sometimes walk away from, but we can't. So do we use the revolutions to help us address both new and emerging issues and deal with things that have been around for a while and to be conscious of every new innovation, the impact that it has on the environment, both the built environment, the psychological and social environment, the physical environment, everything. Are we really conscious of what that is? And um, before Tom went, I had made a note that was kind of a value um, statement about, are these revolutions good? That's very normative, right? Are they positive? Are they working? Are they of value? Are they purposeful? I, I think those are questions we have to ask and, and to really think about how do we engage those that are affected, the broad range of stakeholders, in a set of decisions about whether these revolutions and these new technologies and these developments make sense and should be used and how, or do we just impose them on people and say, come along as you can and catch up if you can, and if not, sorry. Um, and, and so what's our role in this? Even if we're not the creators, do we as the broader public have a role to play in saying, wait, stop, you know, let's, let's dialogue about what this really means. And so across those range of issues, um, if there's a panelist that wants to weigh in or ask a question to each other, we'll do that, and then we will throw it open to you, and you can ask a question about anything, you've heard their background, they can either answer it or not, you know. We're all good at figuring out if we have answers, so don't feel like you have to limit to what you heard them say if there's an issue that's of interest to you. Yeah, I, I wanted to, to oh, thank you, I'll follow on a point that, that Jeff made that, um, that the pro problem with a lot of the proposals about changing education is that people actually are focusing on information delivery, not education. I want to push it one step further. Maybe the problem that is that we're focusing on uh, even education when universities are criticized, rather than on the university as a social institution. Um, I mean, years ago, Clark Kerr, the president of the Chancellor of the University of California wrote a book called The Uses of the University, where even back in the 60s, I guess that was, he was pointing out that the university did education, but it did much, much more. And here at a land grant, we're certainly aware of that. Is that part of the problem? Yeah, I, th I, think, the, I think the conversations around transformation and change around education are, are compelling just because it's also about all of those things. And so when you look at, when you understand education in a global scale and you look at the coming demand for higher education in places like, well, China, India, Africa, you can just focus on those large chunks of the planet. It's inconceivable that they can build universities like this one. That, that is not how that demand is gonna be supplied. And so what they have to do is build, uh, or partner, they have to build radically different kinds of universities, different kinds of social institutions. And I think, um, so keep that in mind. Um, so let me add another, I'm, I'm gonna juggle here for a minute, let me add another ball to that. Um, and that is, when you look at most of the current critiques of education as being caught too costly and out of touch, um, what they really are, the implicit and rarely explicit critique of higher education in the U.S. is, is on its, on its, as a social institution. So what they're really saying in many of those critiques is that we ought to jettison our, this notion of a university as a compelling and transformative social institution. So the things that have to go away in most of these critiques in order for universities to be less expensive, and I don't think less expensive is really the first thing to focus on. Um, 
you have to get rid of the research mission of a university because that is a cost center, not a, that is not a revenue center. You, the research functions of this university cost this university money. We do not, we do not make money on the research functions of this university. No, univer no research university makes money on its research, fu research functions. It's subsidized by tuition and other sorts of things. You have to jettison that. And you have to jettison all sorts of other compelling things like the land grant mission of this university to be of service to the people of the state of Michigan. Or if you're paying attention to the political conversation in the state of Wisconsin, the rewriting of the Wisconsin promise by the governor of the state of by the governor of Wisconsin is explicitly redlining the social, um, the social and cultural function of the University of Wisconsin in that state. So all of those things are on the table um, in this argument about, or this critique, or this conversation about how to transform um, education. And so it's a, it's a very complicated, complicated picture. I focused on learning. Um, and I think there is, tremendous, um, there is tremendous movement that is possible in the near future around making this institution and institutions like it um, demonstrably better places to learn. And that can scale beyond, that can transform the university around its edges. It can also make this university more valuable to the planet in particular ways. But I agree with you. I think this conversation is complicated because at least implicitly, and that's the insidious part in some places, it really targets the, the, func the social function of an institution like this, which for most of our history has been I mean, I, I love universities. I think they're the most amazing things in the world. They have been truly remarkable human, human inventions, uh, and, and we should not uh, walk away from that um, easily. Does that help? Yeah. So why don't we take some questions, and if we need, we'll open it back up to the panel at some point. Um, I have a question for Patrick. Yes. You addressed the issue of 3D printing. Mm -hmm. um, how much do you know about the uh, liquid-based 3D printing that they just recently developed and researched at Carbon 3D, where they have a thin layer or window, and they let a certain amount of carbon and light into it and have a liquid base instead of it actually coming from layers on layers on layers applied on top of each other, they like draw this solid substrate or subject or how would you say product out of like a liquid base and what do you think are some of the implications with that like have you seen transformers like you know when terminator is being chased by a how would you say the metamorphic <laughs> liquid type of yeah. uh, a, 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 how would you say android or bionic cyborg and like what implications do you see with yeah. that technology yeah, yeah. and the development of that technology though okay well, I cannot tell you anything about social implications about that, but I can tell you about the material, how when they change from a liquid to solid, there is a major change in dimensions. So when liquid phase becomes a solid, it becomes much smaller. So when these, uh, and that's actually uh, one of the major problem with the 3D printing. When you have a liquid phase that has been solidified, and you have another layer of a liquid phase that is being solidified, it's like a pinching the other layer. So eventually it will fall apart. And that's the, that's the probably the most critical uh, problems that we have with the 3D printing. So if you're trying to make, so one implication is as you start making this thing, they'll deform into another shape. So these things happen. Um, so about that movie, I, I think it's still far from, <laughs> <laughs> Far from now. <laughs> but, actually, actually yeah. I can transform into a cyborg right in front of you. I'm, I've got a metal base. Uh, so I'm going to look around for other hands right here. OK, I'll just make some observations. And if you'd care to comment, uh, that would be great. Um, so Brian, um, I heard about somebody who uh, couldn't face all that data, so they uh, transformed it from what they see to what they hear. And maybe there's an algorithm to change, to notice when what they hear is not cacophony, but something harmonious. And then look at, just look at the part that sounds harmonious. That's a pattern. Um, and I think it was uh, Dr. Dietz uh, who talked about involving people in decisions that affect them. In the disability rights community, we call that the independent living principle. 
So instead of having the doctor and the therapist and the other therapist and the other therapist saying that you will never ever talk to anybody who is not paid to work with you, you can say, no thank you, I don't care to have speech therapy at all, ever. Um, in education, um, I think of in, uh, intelligence quotient and emotional quotient. And um, some of us who only learn knowledge and facts have a sort of a minus 10 emotional quotient, and that doesn't seem to be good for the future of the planet. Um, I didn't hear anybody saying anything much about open source um, technology and the effects of that. Maybe Emily would have some ideas about that. I also totally admire and value the usability center here at the university, and I wish everybody, everybody would run everything through it. Um, and I didn't really hear anything about nanotechnology and you know single molecule fabrics that do miraculous things. So, anybody want to talk about any of that? Would be great. Well, so I guess I can jump in about the data. Um, I think that's a very interesting idea about uh, taking some flood of data and passing it through a filter and letting your ears sort of listen instead of trying to make sense visually. Um, but it actually sort of reinforces the point that I was making, which is you have to filter that data, right? So if you have a huge flood of data, in order to turn it into a waveform, you have to throw out a lot of it. And so if you, you know, for example, if you collect some data set that has hundreds of pieces of information about every person or object or something like that. Uh, in order to turn it into something you can hear, you have to essentially reduce it down to one or two dimensions of information. So you are implicitly, impl you know, you're, you're either explicitly or implicitly putting filters on that um, or preconditioning the data into some form that you think is relevant. And so, uh, so that you can get information out of it. And so that's one of the real challenges. And so um, we have a lot of people on campus that deal with what we call big data, which is just a buzzword, you know, data science. So really it's just, you know, how do you deal with this flood of information? And a lot of it is compressing, you know, information. We have <coughs> thousands of dimensions of data, you know, lots of pieces of information, um, you know, dealing with it and trying to make sense of it, and trying to sort of take it from vast different, vast quantities in many different dimensions down to sort of something sensical so that we can try to sell you more stuff on Amazon, for example. Um, but that's a real challenge. Um, and also you made a point about open source uh, technology and open source software. I actually do a lot of development of open source software. And so, um, you know, I think that that's uh, open source science and reproducible science is actually something that I feel very strongly about. And so, um, I think that has the potential to be something of a quiet revolution in the sense that um, particularly in, well, in the sciences often, there are proprietary technologies that people create and the National Science Foundation and other, other federal funding agencies have really started pushing people to sharing their methods, sharing their data sets, sharing their software, things like that. And so maybe revolution is not the right way, but it certainly helps to accelerate uh, progress. Yeah, just to follow on on open source, I mean, I, I agree, I mean, there's a long-standing norm in the social sciences that major, I'm oh, sorry, a long-standing norm, is this thing on? Yeah. Okay, thanks, sorry. A long-standing norm in the social sciences is that any major data set has to be archived and available. Um, maybe not to everyone just because of the transmission problems, that will change soon for right now to anybody at the university. And uh, there's, uh, journals are now moving towards that you have to provide uh, online all the software code in an open source program and the data so that anybody can replicate your work. Um, and that's, that's becoming, I mean, so there's, it's, it's gonna go a little slow because we gotta figure out quite how to do that. Maybe in other disciplines it's further along, but I'm aware of some social science disciplines where that's a, a requirement from now into the future. So yeah, open, sor open source is really gonna be very important. Hello. Oh, hi. Um, I just want to thank you all for taking the time to host this. This is fantastic. I love these lectures. Um, I, uh, this is kind of a question for um, anybody, really. And um, it's kind of a basic question, uh, essentially what um, you had summed up earlier, like, is it a good revolution? And uh, Jeff had mentioned that uh, learning is a process and education is a system. 
I noticed there's this um, theme of a systems way of thinking about all these new developments in technology and, and in social circles. I mean, and yet the trajectory of the species is heading towards, well, I guess the data speaks for itself. <laughs> um, I guess I wanted to ask, are there any exemplary models um, from the states and policy or um, 3D printing and devastation areas or like education and new approaches to address um, like student apathy, for instance, and getting students involved, or algorithms that have ads that teach people more so how to adopt habits that aren't at the expense of the planet instead of trying to buy something. Um, I mean, there's gotta be some way, I feel like, that these revolutions can be distilled into sustainable and like very conscious ways of living. And uh, I guess my question comes from a place of concern because I don't see that happening with my generation at the moment. And I was wondering if you could, uh, if each of you could talk about that. I mean, the reason we do these diagrams is because we want to find out why and how those states get up into that quadrant. We've actually got a, a, another diagram that's a little more complicated where we're looking at countries. How do some countries produce high levels of well-being for their citizens without doing much damage to the environment? So what, how do they manage to do that? As to the, the issue of sort of individual behavior, um, it's actually a huge area of research. We know an awful lot about how to motivate, how to inform folks in terms of behavior. Um, the problem is I just published a, a sort of an editorial saying that EPA is, is now asking for power plants to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, but it's not clear that they will allow behavioral change to be part of that response. And yet we know that there are huge energy savings in the U.S. to be had by people stopping wasting money by using energy inefficiently, you know, not freezing in the dark, but simply doing things that will save a lot of energy without noticeably changing the quality of, of life in terms of what you're getting from energy. So, but we know a lot how to, about how to do that. What we're trying to argue is EPA, pay attention. We know how to do this. It may not be quite as precise as re-engineering a part of a power plant, but it's reasonably precise and it has big payoffs. But there is a huge research literature ongoing on how to do those kinds of things, how to you know, help people make decisions that are good for the planet. Um. Dr. Gribble, I guess this is sort of a question for you. Um, I'm sort of interested to hear your two cents on some of the hybrid courses or online courses they have, um, like here at MSU, I think. Um, kind of a common student complaint about them is that even though you know, the lectures are maybe online or available, um, there isn't necessarily the motivation to watch it on schedule or you know, even watch it all. Um, and I'm just curious if you think those are kind of steps in the right direction or you know, what they need. Um, to make them better, what have you. That was me, huh? Yes. Yeah. So let me, let, me, uh, let me go back to the previous question, too. It depends on what day of the week you catch me, whether I'm depressed or hopeful about um, education as a system. Today I'm depressed. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. I, so because of the, the company that I have, we, we do a lot of work in K-12, and um, that's a We've done a lot of damage to, um, to K-12 education uh, over the last 25 years with an obsession on certain kinds of measurement. And it's gonna, we're gonna have to undo a little bit of damage before things get, get better. And so I think we've produced students who um, care about the things we've made them care about. And that is um, sort of an over, over, focus over much on certain cognitive um, outcomes with regard, with regard to education, test scores, getting the answers right. And we now have a conversation on this campus about rethinking about how we educate um, undergraduates and graduate students, but certainly how we educate students. And one of the reasons we're trying to rethink how we, re -edu how we educate MSU students, is the conversation goes under the rubric of the T-shaped student, is because we're not, the, the kinds of human beings that universities are producing are not are not capable immediately or quickly enough of doing the things that, that society needs them to be able to do, thinking in the ways that they need, we need them to think, feeling in the ways we need them to feel, um, being able to develop the sort of non-cognitive outcomes that are important in education. And so part of that is undoing um, what we've wrought um, in, in K-12 education. I don't blame teachers um, or schools per se on this. This is, a, this is a cultural and a social decision we've made. It's a policy decision that we've made that um, I think is quite unfortunate. 
So where am I going with this? I think it probably addresses the issues of motivation. And so I think one of the things that is, at least in my own experience as a teacher, one of the things that is challenging is when we create educational experiences for students which are disruptive for them, which are very different from the way in which they've been disciplined um, since they were kindergartners. Um, they tend to resist them. They tend to not want to do them. They tend to um, want to know what is the right answer here? Um, how do I get, how do I, was this going to be on the test? All the classic answers. And so um, it's hard for us as teachers sometimes to facilitate certain kinds of motivations in students uh, for them to think and do some things independently. Um, so I think some of, the, some of the things that are maybe a little bit more innovative with regard to learning on this campus, um, I think do run into the fact that students aren't sure how to experience that environment. Um, and because they're, it's, it's much easier for them to, to, be, to behave and perform in ways in which they've been um, expected to behave and perform. So I don't know if that directly addresses your question of motivation. Um, but I think, I don't know what I think. I, I, I just think that I'm depressed today about the state of education and, and, and the, the problems are so complex that um, sometimes it's just easier to focus on, on can I create a more compelling learning experience this semester than I did last semester. Um, but that's not really my job anymore. I'm supposed to think at scale right now. So that, uh, that's a reaction um, to what I think is a really hard problem. And as we bring forth the next question, I, I want to add that I think part of the answer actually sits with the students, right? Because we're otherwise just imagining what would motivate you, right? And so finding a way to have you enter the dialogue about these are the types of things that motivate different segments of the student population and why is actually the way to get there. It's back to involving those affected in the decision, because otherwise we're just recreating us, which isn't going to work for you. Mm -hmm. um, I was real interested in what Tom talked about uh, with um, uh, uh, consequences that we don't intend to have happen. And that made me jump back to what Brian said at the very beginning this evening um, about uh, scientific theories are created, have in the past have been created and then proved or disproved proved with, um, with research. Then we have this huge influx of data and then I think you said it's becoming that people are taking data and from the data creating theories and I wondered if that is a um, if that is a responsible way or, an, or a good way to go if, taking what Jeff is saying, if we're not uh, addressing higher level thinking skills accompanied with uh, attention to humanity and morality, and the people doing, using all this data to create new theories and make decisions for unintended consequences, now are making these huge decisions that um, through data travel quickly through, through for around the whole world uh, and with lacking some level of responsibility to avoid those consequences. I think I, I, I'm kind of confused, but at what level is anybody help going to be or is anyone being held responsible for the decisions they're using based on the data we're getting. Yeah, actually, I think that um, the question of accountability is really important, especially in systems where there's a machine intelligence that's making choices for you on your behalf. Um, I was actually recently just at a workshop that was all about algorithmic transparency in the media. And they talked about instances where uh, there's an algorithm that's moderating comments on the New York Times website and deciding which ones to approve and which ones to not approve automatically um, based on patterns of similarity with other comments that have been posted successfully. Um, and so what this workshop was about was what kinds of information will we need to provide to users about what these algorithms are doing to provide enough transparency such that um, we can hold the designers accountable, um, we can hold the technologies accountable when there are these unintended consequences. And so we brainstormed things like, well, maybe we need to tell the users about the bias that's inherent in the algorithm. 
but sometimes bias is based on your point of view, and algorithms don't really have a point of view. It's a set of rules, and so we sort of got stuck thinking about that. Um, and then we thought, well, maybe if we just put the designer's name on the website, then we would know who to blame if the algorithm was misbehaving. Um, and, and people like that idea. Um, you know, our articles on news websites have bylines and authors and things like that, so that was something that made sense for people. Um, but ultimately, it was this idea of cause and effect that we need to have some kind of traceability. So if something happens that is unexpected, unexpected things happen all the time, um, but there needs to be enough information about sort of how, how, what causes lead to what effects in systems like this so that we can actually sort of pinpoint what's going wrong and correct it. And when you have a system that's basically um, technology that's created by people, I think it's a lot easier to have that kind of accountability than if you're talking about a natural system, for example, where we don't really understand all the moving parts. So. Just, just real quickly note that, of course, the whole issue of accountability is one of the major th oh, sorry. I can't tell when it's on or not. Okay. Closer. Closer. Okay. Um, the whole issue of accountability is a major, major issue around the use of drones and eventually other kinds of rogue weapon warfare. I mean, who's going to be held accountable when, a, when drones kill somebody? You know, and, and there's a lot of discussion about this in policy circles now in terms of chain of command and those kinds of things. So, but I think that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of these larger problems of when the systems are making decisions and it becomes so complex, how do we attribute responsibility? It's a great well, and I think just to sort of follow on to this, I think there's a there's an interesting point to be made that um, the algorithms that you use to deal with massive amounts of data often um, rely on something that we call machine learning or you know inference, and so uh, generally you make a software system where you you know, condition, you know, you give it some set of initial conditions or some set of conditions and some desired outcomes and then let it kind of do its thing on real data after you're done with that. You know, train some algorithm to do something in a, in a probabilistic way, in a statistical way. And um, that can have some very interesting unintended consequences when you don't, when the, what you've trained it, what, when the data that you've trained it on isn't the same as the data that you actually feed it when things come out. That's very entertaining when you're applying it to astronomy, but probably less so when you're applying it to Facebook um, and what people see. And, uh, and I do think there's, there's sort of an interesting thing to point out there where the people who are learning to do all of the technical things generally aren't thinking very much about the social consequences of their actions. Um, and I say this because I train physics and astrophysics grad students who, you know, sometimes go on and become professors, but mostly go on and get jobs at Groupon. And, uh, you know, and there's a, a very sort of tinkery way of approaching things where, uh, you know, one of my former grad students works at Uber, and so they'll mess around with where cars are going to be and how long it takes people to get from place to place. And, you know, people are using this to transport, you know, people who are in labor into the hospital, and things like that. So there, so a lot of this sort of tinkering around with algorithms can have very real human consequences. I think Facebook, there was an article in maybe the New York Times about how uh, people were doing these huge social experiments in Facebook, basically invisibly to the users, and um, that sparked a discussion about, well, certainly online and then in my department about like how many people can you kill just by sort of messing around with what people see in their news feed. Uh, in terms of manipulating their emotions. And so one of the things that I find a little alarming is just that the people who are trained to do the technical aspects really, it never even occurs to them to think about the ethical parts of it or the, the sort of human consequences. I don't know, that was a bit of a tangent, but what you said just made me think about that. I got a general question. I don't know if the panel, anybody on the panel will answer this. If we were to graph this technological progress from the stone tools to machine tools, the 3D printing, and who knows where it'll be in five years, against human evolution, you're dealing with an organism 100,000 years old, maybe that hasn't changed basically in that amount of time. You basically got an XY axis. Is there a point where we're going to be so div divorced from the technology that we won't, be, we won't be able to handle it? I think that's roughly what futurists call the singularity. <laughs> I, 
So I, I don't know if we'll be divorced from it. So my version, my version of what's consistent across all of these talks tonight has been robots, um, which we can think of both as metaphorically and as quite, quite, quite materially. Each of us in our talks has, has put on the table for consideration different ways of, different ways of thinking about robots. So an algorithm is a robot. So it, these are little machines that we make that, that we think make the world a better place. Um, but I think it's clearly an open question for all of us whether the machines that we actively participate in making, this is what we do for a living, actually do make the world a better place. And we worry about that a great deal. The, these become the dark nights of our soul sometimes. But to address your question, I think it's not, I think these machines, I think the more likely scenario is these machines become so ubiquitous and embedded that um, we really do, we really do traffic in these machines in our bodies and our minds in ways which are more seamless, are become increasingly seamless. And this happens on time scales that we probably don't notice it uh, maybe as much as we should. So the notion of embedded computing in our bodies is not really that far away. And there are certain, there are certain robots I'd love to have embedded in my body, right? And, and others maybe not so much. I would love, I would love new knees, right? Well, but let me just uh, uh, complicate it in terms of, for all of you, in terms of the question that was raised, which is to what degree, when you think about uh, the idea that there's all sorts of choices based on Emily's presentation, that we don't, we don't even have to worry about them because other things will make them for us. You know, so to, to a degree, Tom really raised the issue of decision making. So how much deliberation must go on before a decision is made? And now technology kind of shortens that possibility. Perhaps an al algorithm can make all sorts of decisions for us without us even having to worry about them. Well, maybe some of those decisions are ones that we have to worry about. So I guess I would challenge the panel. I think what the, the speaker was really asking is how much do we as humans have the ability, I think it's an old question, to keep uh, human control over these technological decisions that you've all laid out tonight. And if I might, I'd actually like to start with Patrick because I want to go back to the social implications of 3D printing and bring that forward and then move out from there. Yeah. Well, the, in terms of 3D printing, I think the industry is using it ex ex extensively because if you now look at the car, uh, open up the hood, if you look at the individual uh, part that's inside, it's made from everywhere. But somehow they have to put it together and they have to fit each other. So 3D printing is used in order to make sure these products will fit each other. But in the, in the university setting, uh, when I was graduating from college, I don't think I ever made anything. We were able to just draw it and show that it works and that was the end of it. But now what students are doing is they actually make these things and test it out which is completely different ball game now. So I think things are changing. I don't know whether it's for the better, but it's, it's changing. Well, it just sort of feels like there's an arms race, isn't there? I mean, <laughs> in some sense, you know, we, we create machine, we, you know, we create algorithms that uh, help us produce more information and deal with, and then we produce algorithms that help us deal with that information. And so, you know, we're sort of outsourcing the future shock to yeah, yeah. software, right? Oh, one other comment, uh, I, I, I've been talking to a GE Energy people about these uh, big wind uh, generators that you see often everywhere. In fact, when they're built these things, they just want to make sure it's reliable and make sure they don't have to do the maintenance, so they put all kinds of sensors. The problem is they don't know what to do with these data, which are very <laughs> important, but it is, they are producing so much data, they don't know how to process it. So there is a real engineering problem there. Well, and I mean, and data doesn't inherently have value. I think that that's, that's, that's one of the points. So we're, you know, MSU is launching a new um, department of computational and data science, and I'm going to be part of that. And, uh, you know, as part of that, I've gone around and talked to people at a bunch of different companies. And I went to a company that was very visibly hiring data scientists. And I'm not going to name the company, but it's, you know, someone who has a big presence in Michigan and asked the people who were doing the hiring, 
what exactly are you looking for? Like, why are you looking for data science scientists? And their answer was more or less, well, we're collecting all of this data about our manufacturing processes, about our sales processes, about our business processes. We sure ought to be able to make some money from this somehow. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a very interesting moment because I said, well, how? Like, how? And they said, well, that's why we're hiring data scientists. Do you really know what data scientists do? Well, you know, they tell us how to make money out of data. <laughs> 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 and so, but I mean, that, that really does, I guess the point is that you can collect tremendous amounts of information, but you know, as Patrick was saying, it doesn't necessarily mean it's useful in any way, shape, or form. And a lot of it is, a lot of it is how you put it together, yeah. but some of it, you know, has no use. So. Um, you all are clearly spending your lives thinking deeply about all of your very important subjects and and uh, doing important research. How often are you consulted when? the things that you're studying have implica implications for policy, and how often are, you, are your recommendations uh, taken f by policymakers? Uh, you know, just if you could just react to that. Start. Yeah, I, I, one of the things I didn't put in was that uh, up until, uh, sorry again, uh, up until, uh, Let's see, during the Clinton administration, when uh, Republicans took control of the House and Gingrich became speaker, so that was, somebody can help me with the dates, but we, up until that point, Congress had an, a nonpartisan organization that it funded called the Office of Technology Assessment. And any member of Congress could say to this organization, we as Congress may need to deal with this technology. Give us an unbiased report on what we know about the technology and its implications. One of the first things that that, that Congress did as a budget cutting was to eliminate the Office of Technology Assessment. So there right now is nobody uh, in place to give Congress bipartisan advice on a routine basis about technology. Now I serve on a lot of panels for the U.S. National Research Council, which is the action arm of the U.S. National Academies of Science, which is an honorific body. And I spend a huge amount, actually, of my professional time. And what we do is write reports saying, here's what we understand as the state of the science, usually at the request of the federal government, Congress, or the agencies. Um, with the agencies, those reports are very influential, I would argue. I've seen substantial changes in what agencies do as a result of a conclusion that says, this is the state of the science. We never try to tell them, you ought to do this. That's not our job, because that's a value decision. But we do say, here's the facts as best we can assess them the degree of certainty we have with those facts. Much, much less influence on Congress from those reports. I would actually say that um, the influence that I've been able to have so far is through the students that I work with who go off and get jobs in industry and are working for the companies and helping to, to set the policies of the companies. I haven't had much interaction with, with government agencies, but I do really feel like, uh, so the student I worked on the project uh, that I presented here with, Rebecca Gray, is actually now working for Facebook, so I have, um, through the students that I train, I can impact the world, I guess. And I should offer that I'm actually in the middle of a study right now to see um, how important state legislators across 24 states think information is from universities and think tanks, and at what stage of the policy process they use information from universities and think tanks. It's, the percentage is, is lower than, you know, of course, their fellow colleagues and, and things like that, but it is used. But the issue is how do you get to the right state legislator at the right point in time. So part of the study is really helping university researchers understand the leverage points. At what point in the policy process, so when a problem's being identified or legislation's being drafted, there's a greater chance of having an impact um, than at committee work, but there has to be a hearing and you have to know about it to be able to have an impact. Once it's time to vote, there's there's no influence that we're going to have, right? And so how do you front end the process in a way that people will receive what you have to offer? And it can't be your journal article, right? <laughs> it, it has to be one page of really sexy bullet points that get their attention. Um, and, and so that's what I'm hoping over the next few years will pan out in a way that not only in this state, but in other states, people can really 
think about how do they make their work transformative. And it doesn't mean that one of these researchers would need to do it, but they need to know who to get their work to so that someone else can do it. John, I had a question for the yes. group. So I'm just curious, by a show of hands, how many people are okay with someone other than your significant other or a really close family member finishing your thought process and your sentences for you, just by a show of hands? So there's, does everybody understand the question? Wait, could you ask so whether or not is, it's okay if our significant other f uh, finishes <laughs> our thought for us? Okay, I'll flip it. So how many people are okay with your significant other or a close family member finishing your thought process, finishing your sentence by a show of hands? Okay, so a couple people are, right? And others are not so much. I ask this question because what we've all agreed to is letting technology finish our thought processes for us. As simple as when we do a search on Bing, Google, Google, you name it, and we start typing, it decides what we want. When we're doing a text message or an email, it finishes for us. And I didn't see very many people say they're okay with even their significant other finishing their thought process, but we've given it away. I think maybe to the Google rest knows me better than my spouse does. Well, that's scary. <laughs> Well, and what, what I would suggest is that, you know, uh, we would love to order out breakfast for everyone, but I think instead what we should do is probably get closing comments from our panelists and, uh, and then thank them one more time. But any other closing comments from any of you? Thank you so much for sharing your expertise tonight. Any, um, any comments, any last uh, weighing in on anything from the night? Struck mute. He's a close yeah. guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, like, maybe I'd resonate back. Sorry. Re is it on? Uh, resonate back to the university. That one of the values of the university is because it does research, because it's out there in the world in the community, and because it does education, and, and views education not just as learning technical skills, though those are important, and actually, I shouldn't point it. I don't want to mis-stereotype it. Well, I think research is education, too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because we see all these things as completely intermingled and not contradictory, is one of the hopeful uh, places for trying to wrestle with these problems um, across all these various dimensions and complexities. Um, and it's actually where an awful lot of the technologies originally come from, even if they end up being distributed by private firms or sometimes the government. This is where the ideas tend to come from by and large. So I hope we can have this, uh, this institution evolve while it still continues to serve all those functions instead of getting reduced to something rather trivial. So a couple of closing comments. The panelists will still be around for a bit when we close out so you can come up and ask questions. Encourage you to keep your eyes and ears open for the fall. We will have two seminars in the fall and again two more in the spring.